And if you're ready, Alan, I'll go ahead and make you presenter. Alan, are you there? Yes. Oh, perfect. All right, I'm going to go ahead and make so, you presenter. There we go. Okay, good morning everybody. Uh, we're talking about analysis of design uh, and performance best practices. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Alan Faulkner. I am a senior BI consultant with Pragmatic Works. Uh, I have spoken at uh, several SQL Saturdays, uh, code camps and webinars, and I'm an active member of our Arizona SQL Server Users Group, uh, just a plug for those guys. I blog at falcontechsolutionscentral.com. Uh, my Twitter handle is Falcon Technic, and my pragmatic email is a faulkner pragmaticworks.com. I know that we did a quick poll, but by a show of hands or responding, I'd like to know what versions of analysis services are you using today? Uh, and we'll start with 2008, 2008 R2, 2012, or, and 2014. Okay. Uh, while we're waiting for those responses to come in, Alan, your yeah. screen is a little um, zoomed out. We can't see the entire screen. Um, the right side, my right side, is kind of off a little bit. Okay. It needs to be resized slightly. Let's see what we got going on here. Interesting. I don't know if that's causing that. Okay, while you're looking at that, I'll just go ahead and share the responses. Uh, the vast majority of people are on 2008 R2. Okay. We have a few people on 2008, and we have a couple people on 2012, and then two people are actually trying to migrate on to 2014, which is really awesome. Is that better, Rachel? Uh, for me, the right side is still cut off. Okay. Not sure why that is. Mm, are you using dual monitors? Yes. Maybe try the other monitor. I'm not really sure. Okay. Is that better? Um, it's in presenter mode, but we can yeah. see the whole screen at this point. Yeah, let me uh, do this. Okay. Maybe change your resolution to a larger size. Yeah. Yeah. You're on it. You're much more technical than me. <laughs> uh, let me just do this. Let's try this. And press I. Oh, perfect. You got it. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, you. guys. Some of those technical difficulties. Uh, so I heard that most of us are in 2008 R2. Uh, a couple responses with 2012, 2014. The good news is, is that this presentation today uh, will will apply to anything from 2008 to 2014. Um, and I know that we saw so, that our how how comfortable you are with your analysis services multi-dimensional. We had a broad range of ex experience there. And also another question I always like to ask is how big are the cubes you're currently dealing dealing with in the gigabyte terabyte range? Is there is there anybody dealing with a 100 to 500 gigabyte cube. How no. about uh, 500 to roughly a terabyte? Okay. Nope. <laughs> so I know that there has been a lot of a lot of publicity about uh, Yahoo's cube, and the last I heard it was roughly a 30 terabyte cube, and that's incredibly large for analysis services cube. I worked with a retail client in the Bay Area and at the time that that project ended we were at about a two terabyte cube and th that was quite uh, enormous because the cube solution itself passed through about five different developers hands when I inherited it so there were a lot of things that I had to do from a design best practices to retrace my steps and some of these things that we'll talk about today are, are things that I actually had to uh, run through. So, with, a, with what we're looking at today, uh, in, this, in this session we'll discuss strategies and methodologies by which to incorporate 
best practices using the Microsoft SQL Server Analysis Multidimensional are also referred to as Unified Dimensional Model or UDM. Uh, this session is intended to discuss topics and share information to provide as a guide reference and some of the findings I've come across in my experience with developing analysis services cubes. There are many factors that can impact the performance of a given solution. Therefore, thorough testing is recommended to, rec during, during, to determine what practices, methodologies, and changes are implemented in production environments. Please do not go and say, hey, that guy at Pragmatics Works told me to go test this, and you do it in your production environment. Do it in your test environments first. So why is all of this important? Why are these items that we see on the agenda important? This is all done in an effort to prepare you for dealing with these situations as your cubes grow in size. When your cube is very small, these may not be an issue, even if these designs are not implemented in the most optimal way. But as your cubes grow, correct design practices and best practices are going to be increasingly important. So one of the things I like to talk about a little bit is about the different flavors of analysis. Uh, with the in introduction of SQL Server 2012, we have this concept of uh, power pivot through uh, other flavors of analysis. And with power pivot, you can create your own data models from various data sources modeled and structured precisely with fit your needs. With the Power Pivot for SharePoint, uh, Microsoft SQL Server PowerPoint for SharePoint extends SharePoint 2010 and 2013 and Excel services to add server-side processing, collaboration, and document management to support the Power Pivot workbooks that you may publish to uh, SharePoint. Analysis services tabular. Uh, tabular models are in-memory databases and analysis services using compression algorithms and multi-threaded query processing. Uh, the exit velocity in memory analytics agent, or also known as VertiPack, delivers vast access to the tabular objects and data by uh, reporting client applications such as Excel and Power View. Tabular models support data access through basically two modes cache mode and direct query mode. In cache mode, you can integrate data from multiple sources, including relational databases, data feeds, and flat text files. In direct query mode, you can bypass the in memory model, allowing client applications to query data directly at the SQL Server or your relational source. Uh, tabular models, if you haven't worked with them, are offered through SQL Server data tools using new tabular model project templates and you can import data from multiple sources and then reach the model by adding relationships, calculated columns, measures, KPIs, and hierarchies. Um, with analysis services multi-dimensional, solutions uh, use cube structures for ana analyzing business data across multiple dimensions. Uh, multi-dimensional mode is the default server mode of analysis services when you install SQL Server or you install analysis services. It includes a query and calculation engine for OLAP data with MOLAP, ROLAP, and HOLAP storage modes to balance performance with scalable data requirements. So with, uh, with the uh, screen here, we're looking at the learning curve and the scalability. With these solutions, the scalability goes up as you move to the right, and the learning curve also goes up as you move to the right. So one of the things that I like to kind of highlight is before we start really digging into the details, let's see how a typical Microsoft BI application architecture would look. This will give you an understanding of identifying and locating the performance issues and or bottlenecks. The diagram shows a typical Microsoft BI application architecture which has different layers shown from left to right. On the left layer, you have source systems or relational data warehouse. In the middle layer, you have the analysis services cube pulling data from your source systems and storing it in the analysis services cube or OLAP store. And on the right layer, you have reporting applications which consume the data from analysis services cube. Although a typical Microsoft BI application architecture is to have each layer on a different physical machine, that's not usually the case. Uh, very often, you will see these layers overlap. For example, in one scenario, you, you have the relational data warehouse and analysis services cube and reporting services applications on the same machine, whereas in another scenario, you might have a relational data warehouse and the analysis services cube on one machine and reporting applications on another. Or relational data warehouse on one machine and analysis services cube uh, spread across the architecture. So really the point is, is whatever your architecture or your system architecture or designer approach is, you need to make sure that your OLAP query performance is very fast, which analysis services is known for. But we cannot overlook the processing performance as well, as this ensures that the data gets refreshed within the defined SLAs within your organization. 
So basically, when we talk about analysis services performance optimization, we need to take care of primarily three things. Processing performance is during the processing analysis services refreshes the uh, queue with the latest data from your source systems and relational data warehouse and generates aggregates if they are defined. It also creates an attribute store for all the attributes of the dimensions and a hierarchy store for all the natural hierarchies. Though it sounds like the processing time does not matter much in compar comparison with query processing, since users are not directly impacted, I would say it's equally important to make sure that you provide reports with refresh data within a defined SLA. Uh, query performance is what analysis services is known for. There are several ways you can improve the performance of your queries running against analysis services queue. You should spend some time designing dimension and measure groups for optimal performance, create aggregations, and optimize your MDX queries for faster execution. I'm not in a hardware or system expert, but one of the things that you will come into with analysis services is with both processing and query performance is determined by how well you're you tune your resources for better throughput. You can specify the number of threads that can be created for parallel processing, specify the amount of memory available to analysis services for its usage, improve or using better I.O. systems or placing your data in temp files on the fastest disk possible in your environment. So the other piece that I like to talk about is the analysis services internal architecture. And when we have an MDX query come in, the query processor has an XMLA listener which accepts requests, parses the request, and passes it along to the query processor for query execution. Upon receiving a validated and parsed query from the query parser, the query processor prepares an execution plan which dictates how many or how the request results will be provided from the queued data and the calculation used. The query processor caches the calculation results in the formula engine cache. The storage engine responds to the sub queued data caching and data retrieval requests generated by the query processor. It first checks if the request to sub data is already available in the storage engine cache. If yes, then it serves the data from there. If not, it checks if the aggregation is already available for the request. While troubleshooting, you need to understand which component intake is taking more time and needs to be optimized, such as the query processor engine or the storage engine. To determine this, you can use SQL Profiler performance OLAP trace. We'll take a look at that later, and capture certain events, which will tell you the time taken by these components. So, really, basically, what you need to kind of take away from this is a formula engine works out what data is needed for each query and requests it from the storage engine, and the storage engine handles retrieval of raw data from the disk and any aggregations that are required. So, I like to start with the relational data. Uh, data source design. And no matter how efficient your dimension and cube design is, if your source system is not providing data fast enough, processing is definitely going to take longer than expected. So you need to spend some time designing and tuning your source system for better processing performance. One of the key design patterns for a scalable cube is no amount of query tuning and optimization can beat the benefits of a well-designed data model. And I would love for you guys to collectively, on mute, say it with me. No amount of query tuning and optimization can beat the benefits of a well-designed data model. So cubes are typically built on a relational data source that serve as data marts. In general, good cube design follows Kimball uh, modeling techniques. And if you use some of these, you can uh, benefit from them and avoid some of the typical design mistakes. So with, uh, although there are several factors you need to consider while designing databases, here are some tips for designing a relational data warehouse. We, as I mentioned, keep your data files and log files in separate drives. SQL performance is typically enhanced if you place database and transaction logs on separate drives, preferably separate physical drives, uh, because read I.O. for database files is typically random when reading database pages, while I.O. for the transaction log, log is typically sequential. Um, as we mentioned, uh, using a star schema. Now, this is one of those items that's widely debated. 
what most that the most efficient modeling techniques are for reporting an analytics star schema, snowflake schema, even or third to fifth normal form or data vault models, all are considered by data warehouse designers as candidates for reporting. Note that analysis services and UDM is a dimensional model with some additional features like reference dimensions that will support snowflakes, many to many dimensions, row plane dimensions. No matter which model you choose as the end user reporting model, performance of the relational model boils down to one simple fact. Joins are expensive. This is also particularly true for analysis services engine itself. For example, if you have a snowflake that is implemented as a non-materialized reference dimension, users will wait longer for queries because the join is done at the runtime inside the analysis services engine. So if you also choose to be uh, to build your analysis service cube against a highly normalized source, uh, it, it's possible, but you're going to pay a big price. Um, in most cases, the, that price is paid at processing time. In MOLAP data models, materialized reference dimensions help you store the result of the join tables on disk and give you high speed queries even on normalized data. However, if you are running a ROLAP partition, Queries will pay the price of the join at query time. Uh, your user response times or your hardware budget will suffer if you are, are unable to resist the normalization model. So when I talk about a star schema, <coughs> this is an example of one, a recruit example of one. But one of the reasons that I pr prefer the star schema is that first, the dimensional model is a predictable standard framework. Uh, report writers, query tools, and user interfaces can all make strong assumptions about the dimensional model to make the user interfaces more understandable and make processing more efficient. The second strength of the dimensional model of star schema is that the predictable frame of stored star join withstands unexpected changes in user behavior. Every dimension is equivalent. All dimensions can be thought of as symmetric, symmetric entries into the fact table. A third strength of the dimensional model is that a, it is gracefully extensible to accommodate an unexpected new data elements and new design, as long as it's at the same granularity of your fact table. So the use of our dimension tables, uh, with surrogate keys, a, a surrogate key is an integer-based, typically small int, int or big int field. A, Surrogate key should not be exposed to your client tools, and the surrogate key must not have any business meaning. If you expose this key, your end users are likely to try to assign some meaning to it, which will be more than likely be incorrect and only cause more overhead in the long run. Uh, surrogate keys are internal to and referenced only in the relational dimensional model. I was a story that's related to this. I was listening to one of my colleagues speak, and he told a story that uh, the he was at a company where the sales director was in the IT director's office complaining that uh, their number one customer had a key of six assigned to him, and he thought it should be one. Uh, so as, as the example points out, that regardless, you should never expose these keys to your um, end users. And also only provide the attributes that needed. Do not go to your end users with a list of all your attributes and ask them to choose the attributes they will need. They will say they need all of them. Uh, consider moving calculations of relational database. Uh, an example <coughs> of this would be to, for example, to compute the product revenue of the times the product sold. Well, what this does is at the leaves level, the aggregate aggregates the calculations and it will have a better result and provide some superior performance when your cube is processing. With the use of views, uh, it is generally a good idea to build your uh, dimensional model on top of database views as an abstraction layer on top of the database. A major advantage of, of views is that they provide an abstraction layer on top of the physical relational model. If the cube is built on top of views, the relational database can, to some degree, be remodeled without breaking the cube. Depending on the relational source, views can often provide a means to optimize the behavior of the relational database. For example, in SQL Server, you can use the no-lock query hint uh, in the view definition to remove the overhead of locking rows as the view is scanned, balancing this with the possibility of getting dirty reads. 
If you're doing a more real-time uh, processing of data of your cubes, this uh, technique really not really won't work because of the dirty weeds read scenario. Uh, views can also be used to pre-aggregate large fact tables using a group by statement. Uh, the relational database model you, you can do those, and it will help you with uh, hardware resources. When we select data from a table, shared locks are placed on row and key levels. The row key level locking escalates to a page level or table level depending on the amount of rows that are selected. This is where the query hints, uh, no lock or tab lock query hints can assist you with the uh, benefits in, in your processing time. So what I'd like to do is jump, kind of jump over here to my um, Visual Studio and SQL Server Management Studio. And a couple of things I like to point out is that this is a representation, and I'm using the AdvantureWorks uh, database. And this is an example of the star schema within the database and this is using the diagram view functionality. But what we need to look at here is that <coughs> with with these designs, we can have several several things. And excuse me while I pop out of this. I want to jump down here. Hopefully, this will be a little bit better. So, what we have here is, you know, as I mentioned, this this is one of the key differences between the tabular models and your multi-dimensional models. As you can see here, we have our date dimension joined at three different three different uh, times. In analysis services multi-dimensional, you can use the concept of a role-playing dimension. What that means is that we can use our date dimension uh, table multiple times, and in this case, we're using it to join our order date key, our due date key, and our ship date key, and that is now one table serving up multiple or a row for our date dimension. Uh, also, our, our other dimension tables are joined off of this, which formulates this star schema. Here's an example of where we're going to start seeing a snowflake uh, design. Also, there are things uh, that are supported as far as uh, self-referencing or parent-child dimensions. That is a feature that is not supported in tagging. So I, as I mentioned in uh, the other uh, and previously is also doing the aggregates or performing aggregate, aggregates within your fact table. Here's a good example of where we use order quantity times the unit price gives us the extended amount. If you can do these types of things in your fact table, you will get better performance when you're doing processing uh, on your analysis services queue. The other thing that we were uh, also looking at is looking at using uh, query hints. And if this right here is showing an example of our, on our fact reseller sales, using a with no lock query hint. So what I'm assuming here is that I'm going to do a, basically a batch processing or I have a batch window to do my queue processing. And by doing this, this prevents the locks on my fact table uh, when the processing queries start, uh, start when the queue processing begins. The other item, once I want to jump into uh, this, is that within your data tools, if you come in, into a situation where your model is basically built on tables, and in this case, all of my view, all of my uh, references, references or my object references in my data source view are built on tables, but there is a feature within this that you can actually um, replace the table if you choose to with another table. And what that will allow me to do is I can set, select my view now uh, and say OK. I'm not going to do that now. But what that now does is now it leverages that view that we uh, created and that no lock query hint and allows your query processing, uh, query processing and your processing times to benefit from that, from that feature. So now we're going to get into the actual data source design. Now we're getting into now the analysis services cube solution design. Um, one of the things that is extremely important is that 
Analysis Services was designed and tested to work with specific uh, providers, although uh, there are many of the providers available, and uh, the data source wizard will let you choose any compatible provider. The com capabilities and behavior of different providers can differ substantially. This is e true even for different providers that connect to the same database. Therefore, you should use only supported uh, providers. I would say use native providers. Also, uh, because the analysis services server runs in native code, you can get better performance by using a native provider. Therefore, do not use a, the .NET SQL client data provider. Instead, use the Microsoft OLDB or the for SQL Server or the SQL native client provider. Uh, the other item that's uh, really important, particularly if you've already worked with your network team, to build a high-speed net, high network, there are some additional configurations you can change to further speed up your network traffic. Under the properties of your data source, increasing the network packet size for SQL Server will minimize the protocol overhead required to build many small packages. The default value is 4096. With a data warehouse load, a packet size of 32K, or in SQL Server, this means assigning the value of 32767 can benefit your processing. Instead of changing the value of this at, at the SQL Server, you can over, overwrite it in your data source. So we'll take a look at that shortly. Where, where this um, packet size comes into place is that if you look at this, is our, I realize that this is an overly simplified architecture compared to most that people may deal with. But the objective is to demonstrate that if you have a single instance, this is scenario A with SQL, uh, various SQL Server components on it, Adjusting the packet size will have no real, uh, real or net effect on the packet size being passed over the network. If your source system, SQL Server, and, and analysis services are both on the, the same machine, uh, sh you should consider using the shared memory net, uh, net library for better performance. Uh, the performance benefits come from the fact that it bypasses the physical network stack. It uses the Windows shared memory feature to communicate between SQL Server and, the, and analysis services. This net library is enabled by default and used when you either specify a period or local as your machine name or local host or machine name by prefixing machine slash instance name with LPC colon when you're connecting to your SQL Server instance. Contrarily with uh, the system architecture scenario B, where we have more of a distributed architecture and analysis services is installed on a separate server than say where the relational dimensional data is, can improve query, uh, query and processing performance by changing the packet size on the data source to allow for larger packet sizes to be transported over the network. Uh, this minimizes the protocol to build those many small packets or data packets, and this can, can benefit your processing. So you might ask, well, what, why is this important? The RMQ processing data moves from your relational data warehouse to analysis services uh, via what they call TDS or tabular data stream packets. As data movement between the relational data warehouse and the analysis service is normally high, we should configure this to have a bigger packet size, therefore less packets, than using a smaller size, higher number of packets to minimize the overhead of breaking down into multiple chunks packets and re reassembling it at the other end. Uh, that is primarily the reason I wanted to bring this up because th this, I, your architecture may vary but this is one thing that can is a quick hit, and you can make this adjustment very quickly to benefit from it. So, and talking about also data source data source design best practices, uh, sometimes when your system is continuously changing, you want consistent data. You might need to pull data using a snapshot isolation mode, which turns, which in turn uses a version of store in SQL Server. In other scenarios, use the default read committed isolation mode in order to avoid extra overhead and copies to the source system. Typically, by default, the read committed isolation mode is typically the best, uh, and that is by the, it is the, your default mode. Uh, with query timeout, uh, with this property, you can specify the query timeout for queries being run against your source system. If you have huge source tables with inadequate indexes or other statistics, your queries are going to take longer, so you make you know, make sure you specify the value which is appropriate to specify. Zero for zero, this value of zero is for a limited timeout. I would say that if you're running into a scenario where you're playing with this uh, property setting, you 
probably need to go back to your relational database and start determining whether you need to perform some maintenance there, like updating your statistics or defragging your indexes or just um, some of those types of things before I would go into this, uh, this area. Uh, the number of co connections, with this you can specify the maximum number of connections that analysis services can create in parallel to pull the data from your source systems during your queue processing. This really helps in queue processing to run in parallel by creating multiple connections to refresh several dimensions and facts in parallel. The default value of this is 10 and you should consider increasing this if you have a cube with lots of dimensions and facts and your source uh, system supports more parallel connections. This, this will help uh, improve your queue processing times. And then impersonation, uh, this allows you to specify the credentials which you will be used to connect and pull the data from your source systems and your analysis service solution. Typically the best practice here is to use your service account uh, uh, setting. So I'm going to jump back over to my data solution, or my analysis services solution. And what I'm going to look, show you here is a couple of those settings that we were talking about. So I'm going to open it, and now what we're looking at is the properties window for our data source design. As we uh, talk about a little bit with this, our, our isolation mode, as, as I mentioned, is the, by default is recommitted. If you're doing batch processing type things, just leave this as is. Here's your query timeout. This specifies the number of seconds that your queries will run before the timeout. Zero is unlimited. As I mentioned, if you are messing with this value and trying to get query, your queries to stop timing out, I would go back and look at your source system before I start messing with this too much. Here is the number of parallel connections that will be uh, launched or the number of threads will be launched when your query, process, or query processing starts and it will run those 10 uh, concurrent parallel processes until the data has been pulled into the MOLAP store and done processing there. Uh, the impersonation, again, usually by default, this is uh, set at your, user, your service account. Right now I'm using my local laptop, so I'm doing it via that way. But typically this, in, your, in a production environment, using your analysis services service account or a another designated service account is the best practice there. Um, and then as I uh, talk a little bit about this, we talk about the packet size and the, the providers. As you, can, as you can see here, I'm using the native provider for 2012. And then coming down just a little bit below that, here's where our packet size is set. So by default, you get 4096. If you worked with your network team to uh, set up pack size throughput on your routers and switches, then putting this in here will also be benefit you on your processing time. So now moving to dimension uh, best practices. Um, <coughs> So a well-tuned dimension design is one of the most critical success factors of a high-performing analysis services solution. It is important to ensure that attributes, relationships, and hierarchies are correctly re reflect the data and, the and match the needs of your end users. The dimensions of the cube are the first stop for data analysis and their design has a deep, imp has a deep impact on the performance of all measures in the cube. Dimensions are composed of attributes which are related to each other through hierarchies. Efficient use of attributes is key is a key design skill to master, and studying and implementing the attribute relationships available in the business model can help improve your cube performance. So <clears throat> attribute relationships are an important part of dimension design. Uh, they can help the server optimize storage of your data, define reference integrity rules within the dimension, and control the presence of a, a member properties and determine that how MDX restrictions on one hierarchy can affect the values in another hierarchy. For these reasons, it is important to spend some time defining attribute relationships that accurately reflect relationships in the data. We'll take a look at that in our solution here in a sec. Attributes add to the complexity and storage requirements of a dimension, and the number of attributes in a dimension can significantly affect performance. This is especially true of attributes which have the attribute hierarchy enable set to true, 
Although analysis services can support many attributes in a dimension, having more attributes than are actually used decreases performance unnecessarily, can make end user experience more difficult. So this is a mouthful. Do not create hierarchies where an attribute of a lower level contains fewer members than an attribute of the above, above, level above. So what that basically mean is that means is a hierarchy such a, as this is frequently an indication that your levels are in, in, in the incorrect order. For example, in a geography hierarchy, city above state, it might also indicate that the key columns of the lower level are missing a column. For example, year above quarter number instead of year above quarter with year. Any of these situations will lead to confusion for your end users trying to use and understand your queue. So when I design hierarchies, I always like to think triangular. And the smaller number of attributes are at the top and expand to the lower levels as the number of attributes increase. A date hierarchy is a good representation of a natural hierarchy that is designed in this manner with year, quarter year, month, and month date. So at our year level for 2014, we'd have just a single attribute or one. Our year quarter, we would have four. Our month, we'd have 12. And our date, we'd have 365. A best practice in dimension design is to implement natural hierarchies. The alternative will have performance implications. Therefore, it is imperative to conduct the design steps necessary to remove them and prevent them from becoming problematic as your queue grows in size and usage. It provides significant benefits to query execution and processing. So continue with our dimension design best practices. Uh, because there is no all member, each non aggregate attribute will always have some non all member selected. Even if not specified in a query, therefore if you include multiple non aggregate attributes in a dimension, the selected attributes will conflict and produce unexpected uh, numbers. Usually a single key column is sufficient, but sometimes multiple key columns are necessary to uniquely uh, identify members of an attribute. For example, it is common in a time dimension or date dimension to have a month attribute include both year and month name as the uh, key columns. This is known as a composite key and identifies January 2013 as being different than, say, January of 2014. In the case of a date dimension, it, it also properly sorts the date values in the client tools, for example, Excel, when, they, when used to navigate and browse a queue. <coughs> When you add new attributes to a dimension, these, there are three properties used to define the attribute. The key columns property specifies one or more source fields that uniquely identify each instance of the attribute. The name column property specifies the source field that will be displayed to end users. If you do not specify a value for the name column property, it is automatically set to the value of the key columns property. Uh, the value column allows you to carry further information about the attribute typically used for calculations. Unlike member properties, this property is of an attribute is strongly typed, providing increased performance when it is used in calculations. The contents of this property can be uh, accessed through the member value MDX functions in your calculations. So one, one kind of key thing here is using, using a numeric key column instead of a string key columns or a composite key will improve the performance of attributes that contain many members uh, the best practice is based on the number of the same concepts as using serif keys in the relational tables for more efficient indexing. You can specify the numeric surrogate column as the key column and still use a string column as the name column so that the attribute members appear the same to the end users. As a guideline, if the attribute has more than one million members, you should consider using a numeric key. Um, Looking at setting the relationship type property appropriately on your attribute relationships, um, the relationships between members of some attributes, such as dates in a given month or the gender of a customer, are not expected to change. Other relationships, such as salespeople in a given region or the marital status of a customer, are, are more prone to change over time. You should set the relationship type flexible for those relationships that are expected to change and set the relationship type to rigid for relationships that are not expected to change. We'll take a peek at this in our solution here in a few seconds. When you set the relationship type appropriately, the server can optimize the processing of changes and rebuilding the, uh, of the aggregations. By default, the user 
interface always sets a relationship type to flexible. Uh, also, when uh, avoid using error configurations with key duplicates set to ignore. This uh, has I've seen this more than um, a few times catch people. Uh, when a key duplicate is set to ignore error, it can be difficult to detect problems with incorrect key columns or incorrectly uh, defined attribute relationships and data consistency is issues. Instead of using the ignore error option, in most cases it is better to correct your design and clean the data on the relational database side. Be aware that the default value for key duplicate is ignore, therefore it is important to change this value to ensure data consistency. And we kind of covered this, but always consider creating at least one user-defined hierarchy uh, where you do not have a dimension that contains a parent-child uh, hierarchy. So another reason I uh, bring this up is the uh, project I mentioned uh, that I was on, the, the users exclusively used Excel to uh, query the cube. So if there are too many members to display, in a single list, the client user interface can uh, can use other methods such as filter lists to display the members. By setting the instance selection uh, property, you can provide a hint to client applications to suggest how a list of items should be displayed based on the expected number of items in the list. So with that, we're going to jump over and look at a few things in our solution. So our date dimension here is an example of natural hierarchies. Uh, if we're looking at this, we've got several hierarchies in this. We have our typical calendar hierarchy here, which we have year, semester, quarter, month, and date. Each of these attributes increase by number as they move down the hierarchy. This is also true with these other hierarchies in this date dimension. Uh, attribute relationships. This is where uh, this can benefit your query processing tremendously if you take some time to set these Property. Now it's pretty straightforward when it comes to a date dimension, but as we can see here, the one item I'm going to say here is that we've got our source attribute is date, its key column is the date key, and we also have a member count here. This also falls in line with now our member count being less than our member count on our date attribute, and it is using the key columns of calendar year and count a month number of years. These, these, both, these values here are both numeric and we'll show you where that, that value is actually set and mentioned. The other thing here is making sure that these are set, the relationship type is set to rigid because we're not expecting these values to change over time because our date dimension or our calendar is not going to uh, change uh, you know, days or those types of things. On, on the other hand, if we look at our customer dimension, we have a hierarchy here, this a natural hierarchy, and they're using you know customer geography, country, state, city, postal code, and customer. Again, these are kind of that triangular shape that I mentioned before. Uh, if we go to the attribute uh, relationships, we're going to see that this one particularly is set to flexible because it is possible that the customer can move to a different postal code and this customer's information would change entirely. We have a single key on this, and we have a series of values that provide the key for our postal code. And again, with this triangular concept in mind, we see that our member counts are higher at the lower end and uh, less at the uh, uh, higher end in the uh, hierarchy. So real quick on these <coughs> pieces I want to show, for example, calendar quarter, and if we go to our property screen, where our key values are set is right here. Sorry guys. Yeah. We're looking at our key columns here, and this is where this is set. Uh, and it's set on an attribute by attribute basis uh, to, to get that to, to work. Again, this calendar year is a numeric value, and a calendar quarter is a numeric value. The other item I wanted to show, particularly with the customer dimension on, say, address, if we look at our properties, and I'm going to close this down, we'll see that our estimated count 
is right here is 12,797. They, because that is greater than 5,000, the instance selection property that was set on this is right here, the memory and a mandatory filter. So it's going to mand request a mandatory filter on any items if there is analysis done on those items through, say, uh, Excel, for example. So cube design best practices. Well, what we're looking through here is just uh, you want to avoid including unrelated measure groups in the same cube. A story, this is a true story with this client I work with in the Bay Area. They, they included all of their measure groups within one account analysis services cube. And what they had done is they basically consolidated five Cognos cubes into one and none of those, about three of those measure groups didn't even belong. And I asked why they did that and they said, well, the, the contract was uh, reducing it from five to one, not five to two or five to many cubes. So always make sure that your measure groups are related uh, to the business processes that you've modeled. Um, also avoid creating uh, multiple measure groups with uh, the same dimensionality and granularity. And by default, if you've been working with analysis services, you know this, that uh, distinct count measure groups are uh, placed in a, a separate measure group. But always make sure that you're doing that as well. Uh, then we talked a little bit about this. Use dimensions multiple times in, in a queue instead of creating separate dimension tables. So don't create three date tables. You can use analysis services UDM, and you can use the same date table for multiple date keys across all of your fact tables. Um, you, want, you want to have, avoid having cubes with a single dimension. If a cube has only one dimension, you should consider splitting this single, uh, this single dimension into multiple dimensions based on logical business entities. Typically, uh, a cube contains only a single dimension because it is based on a single denormalized table, which, a cube, which if you're using cube wizard, it's, not unable, it's unable to break those up into multiple dimensions. Um, the data type of measures must be large enough to hold the largest aggregated value, but should be no larger than necessary so that it reduces the storage cost. So uh, typical examples of this is the, the total sales. If you set that data type too small, eventually once it breaks the threshold of, say, the integer range, you'll get processing errors because it is no longer able to uh, include that data type. So. With that, we're just going to talk about measure groups, distinct counts, and dimension usage. When we look at the dimension usage side of things, this is where we're talking about how our dimensions relate to our measure groups. <clears throat> and as we're looking in here, we can see that in our internet sales measure group, we're using the date key columns in our dimension table and the order date key within the fact table to, to make sure that we uh, define that relationship properly. Typically, uh, analysis services is smart enough to uh, do some of this for you, but you always want to make sure that you've got this done uh, correctly because typically if you're on your client side tools and you drag over your dimension and say a uh, order quantity and you see repeating values, it's probably because your uh, dimension usage is not set properly on that measure group. Uh, distinct count. Here's an example of a distinct count here. So it's performing distinct count. You can see that it is in its own separate measure group, but it still has the same granularity as the Internet cells fact table. They'll still have the same uh, attribute keys that we tie back to our dimensions. And as we mentioned, just the role playing dimensions, uh, again, date is the best example of that. Don't uh, include multiple dimension tables if you can, if you can avoid doing that, the best example is a date dimension. So <clears throat> partition design best practices. Uh, partitions separate measure group data into physical storage units. The effective use of partitions can enhance query performance and improve processing performance and can facilitate data management. Uh, you, you must often make trade-offs between query processing performance and your partition partitioning strategy. Um, so <clears throat> one of the things I like to talk about is um, Partition eliminations. Now, partitions that do not contain data in, the, in your sub queue are not queried at all. And what that basically means is that, is that avoids the cost of reading uh, 
the index or scanning the table if you're if you're in rollout mode. Uh, while reading a partition index, finding no available rows is a cheap operation as the number of concurrent users grow. These reads to, uh, begin to put a strain on your thread pool and also for queries that do not have indexes to support them. Analysis services will ha have to scan all potentially matching partitions for data. We'll look at partition slicing here in a sec. Uh, each partition can have its own shared aggregation design, therefore partitions queried more often or differently can have their own specific designs. Um, one of the things that you might read in the analysis services uh, performance documentation is avoid having partitions with more than 20 million rows. I would say that's not necessarily an exact number because I have worked with partitions that are uh, you know, approaching 40 and 50 million rows. Really the key there is, is that you need to test it and make sure that your query performance is uh, um, working well against those partitions. And you also want to avoid uh, having too many small partitions because uh, they should generally be combined into fewer or larger partition, partitions for better performance. As a guideline, consider combining partitions when a measure group has more than five partitions with less than two million rows each. And if, you're, if you have a, a distinct count measure group uh, that includes a distinct count measure, consider partitioning the uh, measure group along the mention that most often use used to query that distinct count measure. So for example, if you're using date and customer, use a combination of that to, to partition that distinct count measure group on. Uh, this will provide improved query performance for reducing the frequency that all partitions must be accessed. So one, okay, we'll talk about that. So partition, Elimination, this basically talks about this and one of the things that are important to note here. So when we talk about partition slicing, when you see a partition that has a query like this, we are basically slicing that fat data for internet cells based on anything that's less than 2005, 2031. Likewise, if we go to the next partition on this one, we can see that we are now providing a slice here that is just specific to 2006. Those are important things to do for your partitions using some of the guidelines that I've provided uh, in this. So aggregation design best practices. Well, what are they and why build them? Well, it is a copy of the data in your fact table, fact table pre-aggregated to a certain level. Uh, it's created when the cube is processed, it's stored on disk. Uh, think of this as being similar to the results of a group by query in, your, in SQL, uh, SQL Server Relational. It makes queries fast because it means analysis services does not have to make, have to aggregate as much data at query time. Why build them? Aggregations are the single most important feature of analysis services regarding query performance. Every cube with fat, a fact table of more than a few million rows should benefit, can benefit from aggregations. So, well, good, aggregate, good aggregation design is important for achieving good performance when dealing with large amounts of data. Aggregation design is com a complex topic and careful planning should be considered when designing aggregations. Aggregations will generally improve the performance of partitions of non-trivial size. It is recommended using aggregations when partition sizes exceed about 500,000 rows. Do not build too many aggregations just because you can doesn't mean you should, um, uh, because if you build too many, this can adversely affect your performance by increasing search space during queries and increasing the work necessary during processing. As a rule of thumb, do not build more than 500 aggregations per partition. And we talk about some of this, something they also assess in your aggregation design is although member and role counts do not have to be exact, they should be reasonably accurate because they will be used to evaluate the cost both on disk size and read time of the aggregations. Over these counts will significantly affect the aggregations chosen by the aggregation design algorithm. Uh, you may you may not find that all members of dimension exist in a partition, especially when the partition policy is based on the dimension, for example, in a date-based partitioning. Uh, when this is true, it is important to provide an accurate approximation of the actual count of members found in the partition.
and we were talking a little bit about this. And I'll talk about usage-based optimization in our solution. And we talked about setting the member row counts and accurately for the partition as well. So why do we not want to build aggregations, you know, just and it goes crazy, go go with it. What happens is if you build too many aggregations, you get what is known as a design explosion or a data explosion. And it leads to the problem uh, where the aggregations become bigger than the original data. So in this case, with the top 